Yeah, welcome back to Cloud Computing and Big Data, Lecture 12, about Docker and container management. And the basics we have basically had already in the, in the first part of this lecture, uh, understanding really what Docker is and why essentially Docker is a little bit more beneficial perhaps for some applications than virtualizations. Especially if you think about that in virtualization, in one way or another, we always carry around an operating system in this, let's say, hypervisor and guest operating system sense. And maybe this would be something that we can just get rid of, right? And think about just that today software engineering is about Git repositories, is about open software being downloadable. Uh, and even if you have certain licenses only, there are ways that you pre-install or essentially put in certain areas, which are then these Docker environments, um, you know, a way of how to automatically install those software. And this is again, the key idea of these containers. So making easy the things to really have in terms of application dependencies, libraries, whatever is required for the applications, even data. If you think about our MNIST idea, would be a very nice example too. You can pre or pre download data or specify already where is the data and then the Docker engine can automatically download the software. So in a way, I think so when alluding a little bit to software engineering, that's why I said we also cannot go too deeply into this topic. Then we basically go back to GitHub and all of these things, which essentially is covered by um, no other professors in this university, particularly software engineering from Matthias Bog. Um, but um, we want to focus more on, on clouds. And of course, then quickly, if you think about these applications and we want to really scale them, like we have seen in MapReduce, we need, for instance, just one or two name nodes, but we want to have 200 worker nodes working on my problem. So no, no administrator wants to do that manually, right? So you need specific ways how to do this and then to deal perhaps with a point that sometimes Hadoop was changing a lot. So you had three or four or five different versions at the same time to support for end users in a data center. Then suddenly you have new updates or a new interesting popular framework comes like Apache Spark, which we observed uh, some time ago. And then you see the migration from lots of different um, applications to different um, platforms essentially. So all that has really motivated this idea about containers to have an abstract way, which is in itself consistent to the versions required. And then that you can essentially ship around no matter where you are, you just have this basically container environment to support, right? So in a sense, you have to have the Docker engine um, uh, or support Docker in order to get a Docker image right in your cloud infrastructure. But as we have seen already in one of the examples in the first part, that is largely the case almost everywhere today. And the second part will be really now pick some different pieces out in this particular topic, because I could talk about Docker and containers surely about many, many lectures. This is a very interesting substance, but um, in a way, um, it's, it's really always the same, right? Because you want to scale software, want to deploy, you want to update software, you come to the software life cycle. So now the second part will really pick some different pieces out of that. And we start again by looking again from the high level point of view. If you remember, we had this example from Ikea and the app. Uh, this was one example where you have then deep learning, where you can just go through the store. You basically have your iPhone. Uh, or whatever else uh, smartphone you have, you take a picture, this picture is directly analyzed with inference on an existing deep learning model that exists. This is usually not very costly. Inference is very cheap. Only the model training in deep learning is extremely costly and requires GPUs. So once you have the inference going and the deep learning framework somewhere behind the service, um, the inference is basically very quickly. And once you are in this and you want to deploy this in different versions, if you think about IKEA changing the pot product portfolio every now and then, or mixing it with new elements, it needs to be new trained, the deep learning network, you can run different versions at the same time using smart container strategies. And that goes for many different applications. You see here uh, on, the bot on the top, all these different industry solutions. Now, if you really 
careful look deeper and deeper in some of these, not all of them, not everybody uses maybe contouriness today, but in many of those you will move in deeper and deeper. You will see in one form or another they run Kubernetes to scale up, to really orchestrate all the nodes you need. You will have some form of images for deep learning prepackaged and so on, and some way of accessing that properly with, for instance, Jupyter as an example. So um, this is really shows you that no matter how big you are in the, or how high you are in the service level hierarchy, when you come to the lower levels, you always have the same problem. You want to scale the computing, you want to scale the storage, uh, and of course you need certain packages. And I think I'm starting to repeat myself. That's why I don't want to do and go now through all the different clouds to say that. Um, of course, here we want to have some example of um, deep learning, maybe just to shed some light on what's basically a little bit different supported here in the Google Cloud for an example. However, uh, as I start to repeat myself, you can see here containers for deep learning with data science framework. So everything you need in terms of libraries and tools prepackaged, but also, and that I found nice here again on the cloud, and that's why it's all read here in the element. Think about a similar setup like the AWS with a container registry. That's what we basically would assumed. But here also they have the whole build process for running, you know, basically for developers. Um, everything is there to really using also this container strategy really as a development process online in the cloud up to basically this cloud code, which um, <clears throat> was a little bit also in, in several videos here, um, which I cannot actually show you here in detail, but it's an integrated development environment that really is everything basing on Kubernetes. And this allows you, of course, to think about this setup that you have a really hybrid cloud setup, maybe for some of your, let's say, smaller workloads, you would consider your own data center in your company or startup. But only for, let's say, very big ones, you go to the Google Cloud or you go to Amazon. And you can do this because you have this abstraction layer of Kubernetes and the Docker images at your disposal. And this is, of course, a very interesting way how to develop software. It goes away a little bit from developers having their own little laptop or um, kind of uh, workstation machines, which are big, bold, rather to a software development, which is transformed with containers inside the cloud. However, a side remark, of course, um, these things cost, right? So it's also something what a software company has to, um, you know, carefully balance about. Is that really something at that scale I need? Or, you know, is that maybe too costly? Something to think about. In many ways, um, you can also think about starting on your own cloud first and how we learn that, how to create your own private cloud essentially, uh, like we have already seen with the Helmholtz Data Federation Cloud in one of the last lectures. Uh, we do this in lecture 13 when we have the OpenStack cloud operating system. This has all the building blocks, essentially what you need in terms of software to create your own private cloud in your company with different services for compute, storage networking. So there we switch a little bit the view of saying we are the ones responsible now to offer a cloud in the company. But of course, think about they want to be still maybe compatible with storage from Amazon. You remember the S3 interface was for instance, very popular. And here you have another popular uh, support that you want to keep alive, which is the Kubernetes and the Docker images, right? So in this sense, uh, we will talk about this a bit more complementary to lecture 13, um, then basically on Thursday. <clears throat> now, when you look into the deep learning container, uh, I think you can imagine it's not so much news for you. Um, you're at the end of this course almost. There are just a couple of links left to several, let's say, interesting related issue like streaming or uh, graph databases, which each of them would fill a complete university lecture series. So we can't cover very much of it. It needs really just to be have pointers which are related to this. But uh, in, in many ways, you see here that the deep learning containers that you have on the Google Cloud are, of course, very similar like the AWS AMI VM images, right? If you remember these, these had different versions of deep learning included, but these have been VM images. So the idea was, of course, very similar of having packages and all what is necessary inside it, and you used it. But here, essentially, you always carried around the operating system. 
And the idea, of course, now of having this deep learning container that you have here as an example in the Google Cloud is that it specifies what is the environment, TensorFlow, PyTorch, or even just maybe the SkyKit Learn, a traditional machine learning and data mining package. But still you describe all you need in this interesting container environment. And then you have a really consistent environment that you can basically shift around and, and use wherever Docker is actually supported. Um, which makes you, let's say, a very powerful model, is modeling environment, if you want. Also, if you remember in lecture six, seven, and essentially practical lecture seven, one, we said, this is a nightmare for administrators. So this is changing particularly often. TensorFlow one, TensorFlow two, suddenly with Keras insights. The initial versions of TensorFlow were lots of changing. Um, the people see in the community that more and more people using PyTorch. So people are not happy of having just TensorFlow and then also Keras on top. They want to have PyTorch as well. And you have seen the example before with MXNet, right, which is another deep learning framework. So if you think about what's needed now for administrators, they have to sit on package, installing packages whole day long and then keep up with all of this with the different versions that also have to work to each, with each other. And, and this is a very good example where exactly all of this could be a little bit more optimized. There's still, of course, someone that has to prepare the Docker-based images, right? But once you have a proper Docker-based image and you share that in the community, as we learned from the Docker Hub, right? It's a community that is really behind Docker. You're not only the single administrator anymore that actually has to, to basically define it. And then as an application user, you go to the Docker Hub and see, oh my God, there are many, many different Docker-based images already. And all of them have one specific unique selling propositions for this or that service, maybe already some specific data included or schemes for medical data, including pseudonymization, et cetera. But the point is really, it's, it's a community, a lively community of open source products with Kubernetes alongside Docker, which essentially has so much momentum that it influences this, the, the large cloud providers like Google Cloud, Amazon, and the others, to, and MS Azure, for instance, to really adopt these open source technologies and to make it more open and portable to really other clouds. If you remember, some critics were going in the beginning to this S3 interface because this was largely just Amazon, right? So this is really helping the community and all the cloud to be how we say democratize a little bit to really be more open uh, so that you don't run into a vendor lock and more easily can actually shift around uh, what you do in terms of modeling, what environment you do, etc. Also part of your assignment you have learned, I hope, um, that in assignment two you remember with the MNIST you, you could run this and suddenly you don't have GPUs anymore and, and you actually cannot do it. But there's another cloud, the Google Colab, which is very nice. But when you start now just copy pasting the same Python script that we had in assignment two to assignment three, it will not work because there are different versions and different clouds supported at different times. And in a way, this shows you nicely that because we fix it then in assignment three, you run it with new scripts or based on the new versions, but exactly should be the learning experience for you alongside these lectures here how difficult it is with portability. And if you would solve that in the next, let's say five to 10 years, that more and more people go to the Docker, uh, Kubernetes and other containers, there might be different containers coming for different purposes, we will talk about it. This has a much better chance of being really portable by just copy pasting your Python code to a different cloud provider and it will work. Right, so with PyTorch, another interesting example, which I wanted to pose here, not because I think you can understand what PyTorch is and then think about the same things we just all described with all the different ingredients, seeing, you know, it uses probably an NVIDIA GPU and it needs a specific version of CUDA and a specific version of, you know, for running on specific NVIDIA GPUs, etc. That's not the case here. Just wanted to show you that uh, the momentum internationally is so large that of course also other providers in the world are starting to coming up. And when you go to PyTorch and you're a developer, you maybe don't always see what's, what's basically behind all of this. And I think this is a good example when 
um, let's say you're, you're basically uh, a developer in terms of machine learning, a cloud developer, and they task you to do essentially some medical record analysis or some financial crucial analysis for a stockbroking company or, or, or in a hedge fund. And then you suddenly start with, you know, using cloud services which are outside the EEA and EU. And this is a particular example. When you go to PyTorch, you don't really realize that very much. I mean, if you click, let's say, a little bit the wrong way, then you land on a Chinese website and then you realize it, uh, that everything is in Chinese. But here the Alibaba Cloud is a very powerful example of the Alibaba Group, which is behind this. Um, and it's not talking about against Chinese here, right? That's not my aim. Um, collaboration internationally is a key in science engineering. That is absolutely not the problem what I wanted to discuss here. That I think the problem here is that we leave the legal frameworks if you go to different of these cloud vendors. That means that whatever happens sometimes with the data, you cannot go and you know request certain elements to be deleted um, uh, and so forth. The same is true as you remember a little bit with the Patriot Act in the US. And China has, of course, a complete other um, regulatory and, and so on framework. So in this sense, uh, that from the technology, everything works nicely together. That's the point I'm making here. So you see they run NVIDIA containers. So container technology was PyTorch bundled for our GPUs. And they, as a developer, you're kind of quite off hooked because you say, oh, it costs nothing per hour and per month. So that's, that's great. So um, I just moved to the Alibaba cloud, right? I learned in AWS, this cost me $24 an hour. Um, I go to, to this cloud. But always think about this, um, that of course, these companies behind want to make money, which is completely correct. But always think about this legal data protection aspects. Um, and because I'm not a lawyer or anything like this, I cannot also go into much details about this. But I think it's people good to be informed about this, that in one click, you can go to a complete different legislation and you may even don't know that, right? And this is an important topic in cloud computing worldwide and data analysis in general. And that was the case I wanted to make with this. So again, uh, here's nothing to be said against China, it's just because, you know, US and China have different regulatory frameworks. Uh, compared to EEA and EU. And of course, when it comes to data protection of individuals, if you think about personalized recommendations, for instance, as a machine learner, which is a very attractive topic, at the same time, a very controversial topic, then you can see that the regulatory aspects are maybe differently interpreted. Again, I stop here being this, just pointing you to this because I think it's important. Another element that we have seen in, in previous lectures, in the last lecture, essentially around lecture 11, when we did our association room minings, where that um, EBM is also doing it. And I think there's no surprise in it. It's another cloud from a very um, tech giant, if you want, or IT giant. And the way how they basically optimize and doing it is very similar. What I particularly found interesting here is the node setup and how they integrate it then in the so-called EBM SPSS modeler. And this modeler tool is around since a long time now, so it's very known. And you have to see that this is a very good example of how existing topics or tools um, from EBM, for instance, it's here as a concrete example, move gradually also more and more to the cloud. So this, this pack that we land the last time, right, this cloud pack for EBM is now nicely intertwined with a program that was around since many, 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 many years. EBM SPS is, is quite a legend in this space, but um, now it has data mining nodes. Of course, you see here in terms of machine learning model link, there's lots of things around. Um, there's neural nets maybe for a little bit, but of course, we have seen TensorFlow, they are quite more powerful tools maybe, but they have an SVM node, it's still used for classification, support vector machines, principal component analysis. So from a machine learning perspective, quite interesting nodes that you need. Uh, and also when you think about other types of classifications, like for instance, uh, random forest here. So having decision trees are usually not a good idea because they overfit extremely the data. Um, but the decision tree is very, let's say, one model. If you have 
thousands of them, it becomes a random forest and not anymore one tree, so to speak. And that's why random forest models are actually quite powerful and still very much used today. So random forests, random trees, using bagging, boosting has very high relevance these days, even in terms of big data. So the point I'm making is here, of course, thinking about the migration again. You have been working in the versions of, or your company using SPSS modeler since 15 years. And now everybody's talking to the cloud. You don't want to do everything new. So basically what's here nicely shown as this example, I think, is how companies gradually with a large legacy track of applications move to the cloud step by step and, and do this, of course, successfully. They take their customers with them. They could also do the strategy of saying EBM SPSS model is not relevant anymore. We introduce a new technology called EBM uh, modeling in the cloud thing. And you have your own problem if you have your SPSS pipelines and and nuggets and so on. Uh, it's a bit more elaborate to go. It's more tree-based approach, how you specify an EBM SPSS modeler. But in a way, this is a very nice example how they don't do this. They take the users with them. Left alone, of course, that also Red Hat here is maybe a good example. Based on Kubernetes has also very uh, commercial-oriented version of Kubernetes. So since it is um, Kubernetes, as you know, open source as an open source community is relatively stable, of course, but here and there some companies put their added value in it uh, or basically sometimes make it also more mature. Um, and with this having their own service offerings, but in, in, inherent is of course still Kubernetes. Then the other example I wanted to go in, which is a very interesting example in, in my perspective, because I am an engineer and scientist. So in this sense, uh, that's why I spend perhaps a little bit more time on this, but it also shows you how the cloud can now, covering really lots of lectures you learned in this basically course, create an offering in a niche market. And by doing so, operating globally. And, and this is really an interesting example because I have seen it growing over the last uh, 10 years, essentially, uh, maybe a little bit less, but um, it shows you all the power that we discussed almost in all the parts of the course. So essentially starting from a smaller company, then extending with interesting ideas, then to, to newer, um, you know, basically to a global market. But then if you are in a global market, you face one problem. You have, let's say many others, which are also in your league of you know wanted to do something and of course there you had to find your niche market and the niche that essentially here from uber cloud and the container strategies and basically was taken is to create containers with very specific uh, technology for engineers and scientists primarily in the oh, basically in the beginning perhaps a bit a little bit more into the uh, computer-aided engineering, but now also covering computation fluid dynamics. So lots of topics which are essentially for the majority of cases, maybe from cloud users, irrelevant. But this is really highly uh, requested and required in daily work by people that have these fluid problems, like computation fluid dynamics or essentially computer-aided engineering. So this is an interesting example where people have used this container technology that we just actually discuss here, Docker and Kubernetes, right? By now you know what it means to use a service offering in clouds. Uh, in this way, you can imagine a little bit Uber cloud, right? So from over to the cloud. So we are basically still sit on top Amazon, have, uh, HP, Google, Microsoft, Azure, and whatever else is supporting our strategy on containers with Docker and Kubernetes but you specialize in providing containers for a very specific purpose. And I just go through them, um, of course, not in perfect detail, but it shows you that still having, let's say, a niche market, you can actually have a very nice portfolio of services or applications you deal with. Uh, and, and in this sense, by supporting, again, very specific packages here or libraries, you will see ANSYS is very much known in, the, in this particular community. Some of you I'm sure know MATLAB, which is often used in science and engineering. We look a little bit on open form uh, briefly together. They all share the point that engineers using it uh, incredibly often to solve problems and they all have in common, they require substantial computational resources. Right, of course, here this is a kind of common concern if you think about fluid dynamics. 
So let's look a little bit on this, um, which is a little bit also interesting from another perspective I told you in the beginning of the course. That's why I also like this example. And we talked in the beginning of the lectures that grid computing was essentially before cloud computing. And here's a very, let's say, personal example from me perhaps, where I know the president of Uber Cloud, of course, since 10 years, if not longer. Um, we have been working together in DISA. It was a distributed European infrastructure for supercomputing applications. It was essentially the first HPC grid across Europe. So you had Chineca in Italy, you had Jülich in Germany, you had basically EPCC in Edinburgh, you had different countries, CSC in Finland. All of these countries together agreed on a common operational scenario, how to do and give scientists essentially HPC computing time. And, and this in a way, abstracting now and thinking about go away from just engineers and scientists now to the general public was then stimulating the cloud computing. At that time when we published this, let's say uh, 10 years ago, of course, nobody was really paying money for that, right? This was all scientific. There was CERN, a big driver of this, having also the, the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider with the big experiment, big data. But in the, in the end, you see the connection, I hope. So basically from this grid, this early grid ideas, um, we developed cloud computing and the interesting thing is now when you see Wolfgang, how he developed uh, here is part uh, now as his president and finding this niche market is just an interesting exceptional idea that grows out of this grid computing because it, many of the DISA applications have been computational fluid dynamics problems, have been uh, you know, in this field of using the specific libraries for specific purposes of engineers and scientists. And I have to say a little bit that, of course, I contacted Wolfgang, I know him since a long time, and uh, we will work with UberCloud maybe a little bit more. And so I got some of the slides from him. I marked them here so that you also know about this. This is not about specific marketing. It's more to think about that this is really an interesting way where in universities also research can be performed. So it's really essentially a container that is very tuned to this needs of you know scientists and engineers, we will talk about it, but not only installing the packages, it's also supporting the build, compute and analyze process that is required for scientists and engineers. And I think before talking too much abstractly about it, I thought it might be good to go a little bit about some applications and the general approach um, with some of the ideas in which areas they work. So again, it reflects essentially, as you see already, um, the whole, service portfolio of engineers and science, which work for climate, which work for the environment. Uh, we have oil and gas exploration. So where do you want to have platforms for oil? Um, there's a virtual heart to understand more how we can go towards personalized healthcare to simulate really, so to speak, a digital twin of your heart to analyze your personalized conditions in the, in the HPC and cloud. Of course, it goes without saying now in COVID-19, I got myself a grant for COVID-19, others as well. Um, it was tremendous to have cloud computing resources and HPC at hand, otherwise these models wouldn't work, right? And you would never find essentially the, the right inhibits and the right um, medicine for it, as I was basically also pointing to you in one of the lectures, right, which I invited under the umbrella of our Arctic seminars here that we do together with University of Reykjavik. So there was a very expert in the field that used HPC and cloud significantly to find new drugs towards uh, COVID-19. So drug design, that's an important part of it. Um, but all the engineering disciplines, um, of course, when you think about constructions, computer-aided engineering, all of that field, um, today and basically in the past had always this problem that it requires lots of computing. There are phenomena like the combustion engine or you have basically turbulence when you want to have li liquid flow or fluid flow, which are incredibly um, hard from the computational perspective. So you need clouds really for doing so. And behind all of these different areas that you see here, which look now very broad, um, you have certain packages which are supporting these specific cases. And this is, of course, now the unique selling proposition. If you get to manage these packages right, 
and have a smart license strategy alongside for some of the commercial packages perhaps, like ANSYS for instance, it's a commercial package, then you basically have a very nice offering that you can have to engineering and you know engineers and scientists that usually not always want to know you know how EIS services are deployed. Uh, where in which network I am. So I'm talking about all the technical difficulties to have all the cloud set up. They just want to have their container. They say, okay, the container offers me all the libraries and that's what I need. So in a way you see that also how this was growing here, as I said, um, from UberCloud in 2012, starting largely after DISA, right? The papers and DISA was closed. The community was moving more towards cloud computing because there was money and grid computing was academic, there was no money, right? So in this sense, lots of elements were starting, Google was starting clouds, suddenly Amazon was starting their S3 storage and EC2 services. So more and more, there was an idea of forming the idea of containers, which was also formed, but for a specific clientele of HPC engineers. So that's why basically you form a little bit of, of course you see it has some strategic partners on the way, with already cloud providers to do so. And when you become a strategic partner of these major cloud vendors, they support you a lot. They can also help you to get known, right? On big, large conferences of MS Asia, you get a talk and talk about your company, uh, one example, or because you basically use the services they offer indirectly, even with your own unique selling proposition product, they still offer you, you know, presence on the websites. And you can imagine that websites from MS Azure or AWS, if you use this and provide their use cases and testimonials, they are of course much more often looked at at some of the, let's say SMEs, although they're around. So it's a, way, a very good way of getting known to these kind of you know, customers um, on the one hand and for, for the cloud providers and for the small startups and SMEs, it's a very good way of you know, getting known in the community. So you see also the, the role of containers really is, in, in, is really branded in this company. And you see from get the idea of saying HPC containers might be very general. They formed a little bit of prioritization here on computer aided engineering software and containers saying essentially more and more getting towards a niche market, right? Thinking about other areas of software, how you deploy them and so on. Uh, 10 years ago, maybe that would be uh, just starting, right? So nobody would thought about 15 or 20 years ago that this would be even possible. Um, and so this is just because you have now the power of virtualization clouds and also the idea of containers. And the more you actually interplay, of course, and be abstract from all the major other uh, cloud providers, you're independent of them and can of course use also the others. You're not locked into these systems, which is another benefit. Of course, you can sell if you provide the service offering. So it's a very nice example, I think, of over time growing with more um, service portfolio, with more applications. You see more and more CAA core partners uh, along the way. And now really being uh, playing a big role with ANSYS, uh, as I said, is one of the primary packages really for doing computational fluid dynamics and other problems in engineering, which is uh, I think also a big step. It was a big step here in 2018 to also get known. And uh, it's basically a very successful walk here of this company um, that, that we have seen. But let's come a little bit back to some concrete ideas of applications and actually how that runs. You see here a couple of lists from so-called packages, right? That are really crucial to this community. If you are in the CIE, CAE um, element, you really know about these packages. And if you provide a nice user interface here, then, then deploy it with several partners like Advania, for instance, here in Iceland, but also Microsoft Azure or HP, then basically you can have a nice service portfolio where you benefit from all the scalability of these clouds that's indirectly included, but you basically have your own niche market of saying we are specialized in this and have special deals maybe also in licensing with others. And left alone that I know basically a lot of these things, right? So if you are specialized in this niche market, um, Amazon hardly can actually compete with you. You cannot call someone at Amazon and say, I have a problem with my computer aided engineering in console line ABC or with this particular container. Can you help me? 
it's getting more difficult if you have a broad service portfolio to support this very specific software requests. Of course, if you go to Uber Cloud, these people are specialists in these kind of, even if it's just a couple of packages only, but incredibly often used, uh, used and so with this can help you much better precise because they do engineering of a daily basis. So that's also something not to be forgotten that of course here you benefit. Still Amazon is there also underneath, right? As the infrastructure provider. So they benefit and also the customers benefit. The idea essentially is now to make HPC services easier. So when you are in my other course, the HPC course that I offer here in spring, you will manage and realize that HPC has some complexity with it. And this was one key why cloud is also so much taking up um, because it's usually HPC made easy in a way to really do um, lots of easy access methods to have this pre-packaged deployment instead of scientists sitting themselves and installing over hours software, which is not their main specific purpose, right? The purpose of engineers is to develop something or to uh, create something, to design something. So spending then time on software engineering aspects is, is quite of cumbersome to these people. The same goes for a biologist or a medical expert, right? So in this, the idea really of this Cloud HPC platform is um, to have it have all the benefits with scalability, with software applications predefined and resources and internationally, but have this complex software installations removed, what we also get as we learned already by using Kubernetes and Docker indirectly, but of course then tuning it for some specific problems. And the problem here, I just wanted to leave here it on the table. Um, to say what computational fluid dynamics is, why it is so expense, expensive and costly and why it's used so often. Whatever you develop, if it is a space shuttle here in the US or a racing car, you have lots of uh, stress, we call that, for different materials. And this is related to velocity, basically on fluid and airflow around these different surfaces. And this is what you basically have computed in HPC since a long time. There are different, let's say, known um, numerical methods based on basically known physical laws. And this is just in a kind of community which is very stable. And if you want to learn more, you're of course welcome to come to my high performance computing course. So I don't go in too much detail, but the, the real part of it is, um, is essentially the computing requirement. Right, when you are in different, let's say, computational fluid dynamic methods based on different, let's say, physical laws, if you want. One is more the conventional approach, basic, basically on the Navier-Stokes equations here. These are partial differential equations that has to be solved. And this is quite costly. So you need to go to HPC or essentially to some, let's say, cloud if you really want to have results. And on the other end of the uh, scale, you have also numerical integration based on lattice Boltzmann equations. So there are different ways how you do it, but long story short, you require still lots of computing. And you have, of course, certain packages which already have this different physical laws already implemented. It's validated as the software does the correct things. And so for you, that's of course an interesting to get access to an environment like this HPC cloud, where all of this is already prepared. You usually use that in example of my course, for instance, is when you discrete here the, the ocean, when you want to simulate an ocean, that's what we can very simply. You just have to discrete it basically over different and then in parallel distribute it over different nodes in a HPC system or in a cloud HPC. And each of these different tiles will be then behave according to physics and through iterations, numerical iteration, uh, we basically solve then the big problem by solving essentially the small problems in each of the tiles. It has, of course, some uncertainty in it, so no, nobody says it's perfect, but it is incredibly often used today um, for, for everything. Um, in car manufacturing, about crash tests, but also new designs of car models, let it be the trajectories of waves um, and basically the height of waves and so on, if you want. Here's a very good example, which goes to a very related field called finite elements. You will see that engineers, and some of you maybe are free from the engineering field as usual, from other parts of the university. So here you have finite elements where you see essentially smoke discretized here over a mesh and then computed in parallel. 
With adaptive mesh refinement, an interesting way how you also um, reduce the load, but still this is often used on HPC and essentially also on cloud uh, infrastructures. So let me come back then to Uber Cloud and why that is so interesting. So when you need this all this computing, you need on the other hand all the packages that matter that have already implemented all this physical laws, have implemented lots of other elements, the GUI tools, um, to create a workbench really, to have different tiles already on a click basis ready for you as engineer. You want to not start and draw tiles from scratch. There are certain modus operandi, how you do things in computer-aided engineering. So these are all things which are nicely supported in the Uber Cloud. This is just a selection of packages here, which are used then for the simulation package, uh, for the simulation then. Uh, by doing the number crunching. And the beauty here, you don't care about the installation. You're an engineer, you just focus on the task at hand. Let it be car manufacturing or uh, designing in, yeah, um, yeah, a space shuttle if you are in maybe Richard Branson's team or so. Um, another package which is interesting is Open Form. It's also supported in Uber Cloud. I picked that a little bit because it's a very famous package in, in essentially the HPC and cloud community with a particular focus again on the CFD problems we discussed earlier. It has also lots of utilities around and um, several methods also to really do the main decompositions essentially here um, to crunch down again a big problem and making it in parallel. Similar like we have seen it in Spark in lecture three and so on in lecture two, but we distributed it not now with Horowat and something, we rather have it in the HPC cloud and use the MPI interface as communication for just you know distributing the physical properties that I have on one tile with the other. But again, I think it's going too detailed how that really would work. That's what we do in the in essentially in the HPC course I'm offering in spring. Then we can things you know have things like here a factory which has you know it can be simulated how basically their um, their production is affecting uh, nearby neighborhoods. Um, essentially with different models, um, so-called large eddy simulations and so on, which then also includes here and there in space and aircraft design, turbulence modeling and so on. But this goes again a bit too far, just that you have a visual representation what I'm talking about when I think about having this now all in a container, which is quite nice, which you could do with ANSYS, which is a licensing uh, package, but also partly with open form, which is an open source package. Now, because we in one way or another are almost done today, I'm just going a little bit quicker here through the service portfolio, not taking too much time. The slides of course will be available and then you see it from deep learning for different parts in fluid flow up to having this virtual heart as I basically say uh, for analyzing different drugs which are induced. Uh, you see car manufacturing aerodynamics here here for simulations by cars, very important topic because this reflects also how much fuel you need. Um, you see all of these different topics are a niche market in a way, but you see also with the application portfolio. Here's another one nice with wind turbines, essentially. It's still a very large customer base that you can get by this and supporting this. And you see here um, just a couple of them um, with thanks again for Wolfgang uh, also contributing to some of these slides. I think here the cost shows that there's still lots of um, revenues, right, um, in the market to catch. Although it's more or less if you want from all cloud applications a niche market, but still a very uh, reasonable one to go for. Because here also you need really specific expertise that large cloud providers like Amazon and you know Azure and Google and so on, they are not really completely interested to fully support that. They have, let's say, a broader portfolio. And as I said, with the cloud benefits, having now these containers, which more and more also enters HPC centers really, which are just focused on HPC and not cloud. So this has a big movement now also going into large HPC centers, which are not cloud centers today. Uh, this is really something where lots of the disadvantages you see from HPC on the left-hand side are actually then a little bit solved with, with going to the container setup that you see a little bit eluded here by providing this. And then of course, in the HPC center, you don't go to MS Asia, you would keep your local premises, but essentially if you support the same 
as we said, Docker, Kubernetes, über Cloud Container Environment, then you still be able to run the same workload. And here's an explanation how you can actually have this in the app store from the MS Azure then to really work with it. But there are lots of references if you're interested, of course, to look more into this. And I think important is also that they, they kind of go with the simulation engineers. So just giving the image and you're done is usually not the way to work in science and engineering. You need people alongside the process that have problem with answers, why it's not working. Why is this particular line of code not working? You need someone with maybe some engineering expertise to know that, right? And so by having also then basically this whole simulations as a complete cycle supported, I think is also a key issue here. Again, something which Amazon not so easily can provide on one click. Here's a very nice, interesting uh, testimonial that I thought I actually computed you and a little bit of summary here. Um, also, again, saying again, the, the license is of course a cre and critical is uh, aspect here in the setups. Um, but still, of course, um, a tailored HPC resource design for this inside the cloud is certainly a very successful model. As we've seen here, also Fortune 100 company uh, feedback, um, which want to not be known, but I think it's, a, it's an interesting way to show that this technology really matters today. So I stop essentially for today by shedding light on uh, two related container technologies, if you will. Singularity is often used in HPC environments these days. Um, it, it would not add too much insight to now go through all singularity for you in a cloud course. You can imagine the same idea as a container technology exists. It can actually build from Docker uh, and so on. So there you see even it works together with the known tools we have already seen. And does then similar aspects in the container execution. You just have, let's say, a little bit a different environment here. And Apache Mesos is more really than the, the idea of abstracting a little bit from CPU, memory, storage, and other compute resources to all schedule that and actually um, yeah, organize, orchestrate again and manage that. It's a bit different, of course, on Kubernetes. And we see essentially now in the next lecture, lecture 13, how that is needed to abstract from CPU, abstract from storage and so on when you want to create your own private cloud. And then using, you know, several services which are in the open stock portfolio, open stack portfolio, what you also can, again, can combine with things like Kubernetes and Apache Mesos. So this all fits together in a way. And if you want to have really details of UberCloud, here's a very nice example how to use this with ENSYS in the ice pack, which might be quite interesting to look in. Uh, how really engineers work essentially. Um, if, of course, it's a bit abstract, but carries the essence of, you know, using then this in the cloud. Computing particularly. That's all for today. And thank you very much. See you on Thursday.